What's going on out there, everybody? You are in the Impact Lounge, the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. This is the Cool Factor Podcast, and I'm your host, T.W. Now listen, the last few weeks have gotten a little hectic, so my schedule's been all out of whack, so we missed a couple episodes, but please believe me, we're going to catch up on it all today, okay? So, before we get started, go right ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you're subscribed to the channel. Hit the notification bell so you know every time we get we drop some new content on this page, you're going to get an alert so you know when that new fire is coming out. And go ahead and, and click the like so that people know how fire you thought this video was, okay? Let's do all that real quick. Go ahead. I'll wait. Boom. All right. Now we're ready to go. All right. Cool. So let's not bury the lead here. I'm going to start with what everybody, if they're not talking about, everybody should be talking about. The BRP50 came out this past week, and Impact Wrestling was represented very well. By the way, if you don't know about the BRP50, uh, the BRP50 is from the Black Wrestling Podcast, and what they do each and every year, they release it on June 19th, Juneteenth, for those of y'all who don't, those of y'all who don't know what that date is, and it is a list of the top 50 black professional wrestlers in the business. Now, these guys rank based on all types of, of, of criteria, um, you know, based on the year they had. I believe they go from May to May, and that's how they uh, that's how they, 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 they rank the category. So on your social media choice, just search hashtag BRP50, and that'll lead you to the Black Wrestling Podcast and, uh, and their list. If you go on Instagram, they did a really nice job of just listing them, you know, with their pictures and their numbers so you can swipe right through and see who's ranked where. Now, because I'm here speaking to the Impact Wrestling fan, I want to look at the list and tell you how Impact Wrestling was represented in the BRP50 because you it doesn't take long to look at the Impact roster and see that there's a lot of black representation on this show. And so, where did these guys rank? Where did they rank on the BRP50? So, I'm, I, I took a look at the list myself and... I had a few thoughts on where some people were ranked. So here's 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 how they ranked them on the list. Coming in at number 47 was Trey Miguel. Number 27 was Tasha Steeles. Number 26 was Willie Mack. Number 23 was Kiara Hogan. Number 8 was Rich Swan, And number 5 was Chris Bay. Now, once again, for such a small roster... It's really great to have that much representation considered among the top 50 in the business. And if there's a glaring omission there, you know, it's Moose. And there's a history there. Trust me, there's a history there between Moose and, and the pod. And there's a reason why he didn't make the top 50 on this list. Um, and if you, you don't have to do much research to find out why he wasn't why he wasn't ranked there. It's right there. They talk about it. Go check out their podcast. I'm sure they'll fill you in more. Maybe I'll interview one of the guys from the pod, and I'll let them tell you about why Moose was not ranked uh, in, in the top 50 on the BRP50. But I want to talk to you about a few thoughts that I had on the way that um, on the way that these these guys were ranked on the list. Now, I thought Trey Miguel at forty seven was a little low, especially when Scorpio Sky from AEW is ranked at number twenty five. Now, Trey Miguel I thought has actually had a pretty outstanding year, considering the fact that he had to completely reinvent his character and had to step up at being a singles performer on his own when the rest of the Rascals left to go sign with NXT. So Trey Miguel was off TV for a few weeks and he came back. He's been getting himself in the best shape ever. And if you look at his matches, I comment almost every week about how Trey Miguel wrestles such an innovative way that he just sees wrestling differently than a lot of people do. And he can do things that everybody can't do. I think it was last year at Slammiversary, he did the uh, the Power Slide Destroyer where he slid on his knees out of the ring and then hit somebody with a destroyer, roll him out of the ring. I saw plenty of people try to imitate that, and it did not go well. So Trey Miguel is, um, you know, he's an innovator. He's a rising star in Impact for sure, and I think he could have been much higher on this list, especially considering... Scorpio Sky is at 25, but Scorpio Sky hasn't really done much of anything. I mean, I think he won 
a battle royal in AEW and then turned around and, and cashed in his title shot the next week and promptly lost and is now in a, a, a tag team with Ethan Page where they're losing to Darby Allin. So, um, you know, I don't know. I thought Trey Miguel should have been higher there. Now, I would also swap Tasha Stills and Kira Hogan. Remember, Tasha Stills was at 27 and Kira Hogan was at 23. Now, they're both dope. The, the partnership with Tasha Stills has brought out a whole new side of Kira Hogan. She's developed her character and raised her game up to a whole nother level. You can see the confidence beaming from her in a way that it wasn't before. She's just getting more and more comfortable in the ring, owning it when she's on the screen. I mean, she's really, really improving, and she's one of the best knockouts they have by far. But that said, Tasha Stills is even better. Tasha Stills absolutely jumps off the screen Anytime she's on the screen with anyone, you can count on her to say something memorable, do something that's going to be, you know, funny or, or outlandish. And uh, to me, Tasha Stills is absolutely one of the best talents, uh, uh, one of the best knockouts talents on that whole roster. I mean, I, I think they'd have to do some maneuvering around to figure out how to do it. But I think Tasha Stills should be in the knockout title picture because she's that entertaining. She's that engaging. And again, when Tasha Stills is on, it's a social media moment waiting to happen. She's going to say something or she's going to do something that you're going to want to remember, you're going to want to retweet, and you're going to want to talk about. So I thought Tasha Stills and Kira Hogan could have flip-flopped places here because I think Tasha Stills is actually the stronger member of Fire and Flavor. Now, two Impact wrestlers made the top 10 of the BRP50. Number eight was Rich Swan, and number five was Chris Bay. Now, I think that leads to a very interesting part of conversation. You ask, obviously, how in the world is Rich Swan ranked lower than Chris Bay when Rich Swan just came off an Impact title run? And I myself was just saying how Rich Swan and his program with W. Morrissey was absolutely elevating W. Morrissey because Rich Swan appears to be in top guy attraction status now. But Chris Bay is ranked higher than him. Now, again, this is their list. This is, you know, their opinion. But here's something that I think cannot be denied. And I say this all the time. Chris Bay has superstar written all over him. Chris Bay seems like the guy that is the most marketable. He seems like the guy that has the brightest future. He seems like the guy that just has, you know, great match and great moment after great match and great moment just waiting to go. But they don't seem to be putting him in that position yet. Now, he's not getting buried on the show. He's used prominently. But I think they can do more with him. I think he can be a, a, a front-facing piece. I, I, you know, I think he should be getting geared up to get in position to start competing for the top titles. Um, I think Chris Bay can be their next AJ Styles. Now, I don't know if they see that same thing. Um, I, I can't say yes or no right now. Because, again, it's not like Moose, right? We're like... You know, I always say Moose should read the writing on the wall that the management, the powers that be in Impact Wrestling only see him going so high, right? Look at every time Moose has had a world title match. He's lost. He, 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 they, they did a great build for Bound for Glory. I think it was with him and Austin Aries. And then he lost to Austin Aries. Um, you know, they had him go on a, a, a damn near two-year pay-per-view winning streak. Um, and then, you know, had the, the, the TNA title, but they made sure to not make it feel like a big deal, right? Then they had him lose that to Rich Swan. Then they had him get a shot against Kenny Omega. He lost his shot against Kenny Omega. So to me, I don't know how much clearer Impact Management can tell Moose that we don't see you as a top guy, but they told him loud and clear to, to me. I don't see the same thing being done with Chris Bay, right? Again, like I would say... He has a, He's been X Division champion, um, and he, he's had good matches, but they just haven't promoted him like the top guy face of the franchise that he appears to be. But listen, when you watch Impact, Chris Bay is memorable. memorable. When you look on social media, Chris Bay is memorable. He has a cool factor, right? We call this show the cool factor because me and BQ sat down, and we were saying, what can we talk about with Impact Wrestling that Impact Wrestling is missing? And it's the cool factor, right? Like, Impact Wrestling, they don't really 
do a great job of, of, of making their stuff seem cool. They don't do a good job of making their matches feel big time. They don't do a good job of promoting their stars and showing us, the fans, how cool they are, right? But Chris Bay has that. He has that all on his own. And oh, by the way, if you pay attention to Chris Bay's, you know, his social media and his interviews and when he does Q&As, he's interested in being an impact guy. He wants to elevate impact wrestling into being one of the top promotions in the country. And if you have a guy who has all the talents, all the checks, all the boxes in terms of presentation, and he is dedicated to uplifting your brand, why would you not elevate that guy to being a top guy in your company? That doesn't really make sense to me. But for this list, Chris Bay came in at number five. And I think, again, the number one reason is the cool factor. Because Chris Bay, he is cool. When he shows you his Jordan collection, you don't feel like he's faking, right? He's, it's, it's not like the Young Bucks where they got some, uh, some, some, some Air Dior Jordans that look like they came from the New Haven flea market. Um, isn't it, <laughs> Chris Bay, when he says something, you believe it. You know what I mean? Like he... He just really exudes cool and and swag and 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 influence in a way that nobody else on the Impact roster really does. Roster <laughs> on the Impact roster really does. So Chris Bay came in number five at, in, in the BRP fifty. I thought it was a good list. I, I definitely could see the controversy in ranking Chris Bay higher than Rich Swan in that spot. I totally get that, but. I think the reasoning behind it totally makes sense. Now, you could also watch that and look at that and suggest maybe they don't follow the product as closely as you do. Maybe they do. Maybe they don't. Um, but take a look at the list, okay? Check out the BRP50. Search hashtag BRP50. Uh, look up the Black Wrestling Podcast. It's on YouTube. Um, it's on SoundCloud. It's probably on, like, you know, all the streaming services like Apple and all of that. And, you know, you can catch up on it. It's a great show. The dudes have great chemistry, three guys to, together, and they also have a stat guy. Um, and, yeah, man, it's, it's, it's a great list. It's a fun list. Let's debate it. What do you guys think about the list? Check the list out and tell me what you think about the list. Drop it in the comments below, and then, you know, we'll talk about it. We'll, we'll, you know, do you think, what do you think about my take on the list? Do you think I was off? Do you think I was wrong thinking some people should have been ranked higher than the others? Let me know what you think. Drop that down in the comments, and let's talk about it. Another thing that everybody is talking about this week is yet another round of WWE releases. Now, this is outside the Impact Zone, but as we know, this is something that could potentially affect Impact. Now, this latest round of releases was pretty much clearing out 205 Live. It was Arturo Rojas, Marina Shafir, Killian Dane, Tino Sabatelli, both the Bollywood Boys, Kurt Stallion, Fandango, Tyler Breeze, R.A. Davari. Tony Nese, August Gray, Chase Parker, and Matt Martell. I'm not going to lie to you. I never heard of half those people, okay? But um, Fandango, you know, he tweeted, thank you to WWE for 14 years of employment. And my immediate reaction was, dog, if you've been employed by WWE for 14 years, you rich, rich. So he's going to be all right. As, as well as, you know, guys like Tyler Breeze. I remember him posting um, a few months ago, somebody was, talking about how badly his career is going. And he posted about how he owns a bunch of houses and things like that, and he's a millionaire. And yes, exactly. If you have had the fortune to work for WWE for such a long time, you've been making consistently a six-figure income. And if you manage your money right, you're going to be okay. So, you know, we don't have to cry for these guys too much, some of them. But as an Impact fan, you're going to wonder, how is this going to affect Impact? Now, first thing, you know, a lot of these releases are way too close to Slammiversary, so they won't be at Slammiversary because they don't fall under the 90-day, their 90-day non-compete clause will not be ending in time for Slammiversary, which is in about four weeks, okay? So you don't have to count on seeing any of these people show up on Impact anytime soon, but they could be showing up sometime in the future, which I think is great. WWE made it a point to just start hoarding talent a few years ago and they the main reason that they did it is so that it would weaken other promotions and impact is a prime example of that look at the knockouts roster okay the knockouts roster could use an infusion of talent um it, it could use you know a, 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 some new characters some people with some some good skills some great presentations some good personality and it's really going to help 
a lot of these other shows. It's going to help Impact. It's going to help MLW. It's going to help NWA. It's going to help a lot of these shows that can benefit from more talent being available. So in the future, it's going to be great. We're going to see more of these talents popping up on different shows. And it's great for who? The wrestling fans. So we're the big winners here. Um, you know, it stinks for anyone to lose their job, but let's be realistic here, okay? These guys are still getting paid for their next 90 days, and then I'm sure their phone will be filling up with booking requests in the course of that time. So if they want to keep wrestling, if they want to wrestle on TV, these guys will all be fine. Because the reality is, being on WWE television is the best marketing and advertising that a wrestler can get for their career. Period. And the fact that any of these guys were on WWE TV makes them more attractive to indie shows. It makes them more attractive to shows like Impact and, and NWA and even AEW and MLW, okay? Because the fact that they were on WWE says that more of the audience knows them. So that leads to the chance that when they show up on your show, it's going to bring over a new set of eyeballs and everybody's trying to get all the eyeballs they can in this world. Now, Another release that WWE made that is making a lot of news is not so much a wrestler, but a writer. So there's a young lady that was hired recently by WWE, and it made a lot of news that was circulating that WWE had hired, I think, two black women writers. And that was, you know, is a big deal, right? Because, listen, if you watch WWE programming, you know that nuance is not their strong suit when it comes to how they present characters especially black characters, right? And so to hear that they hired, you know, female writers and then black female writers, that was something that a lot of people were very excited about. But here's the thing. You can't hire somebody uh, just to check a diversity box. WWE apparently does not require its writers to have a great product knowledge before they hire them. Now, I'm sure this person has great writing chops and great writing credential, credentials, but if you guys pay attention to the things that people say who have an opportunity to work in WWE production, it all comes down to does Vince like your ideas or not, right? Like, does it fit into what Vince is trying to do or not? And if not, then it ain't making TV, period, okay? As Kara Hogan would say, period, okay? It's not it's not making TV, Um but this young lady is apparently far, far outside of the wrestling bubble because she doesn't understand the economy of wrestling content and she doesn't understand the toxicity of wrestling fans, okay? So she did a podcast with someone who she apparently knows or is cool with or whatever, and one of the things that came up on the podcast was the fact that she is a writer for WWE. And she talked about how she wasn't a wrestling fan, obviously, and they didn't require her to have rest knowledge of wrestling before she, she took the job. She talked about not knowing uh, who the main characters were. She said that the, the champion was some big black guy. Uh, she thinks his name was Bobby Ashley. And um, listen, wrestling fans ate this up. This, was, this wasn't a wrestling podcast, okay? She didn't go on you know, Fightful or, or, or Chris Van Vliet or anything like that. This was just some, this was just a three minute clip out of a podcast that had nothing to do with wrestling. It was just talking about what she does, right? But again, the toxicity of wrestling fans and the thirst for any and every opportunity to bash WWE that exists in the economy of wrestling consumption <sighs> it ate her up. And I knew how this was going to go as soon as I first saw this. I knew this was going to go very, very badly for her. And, it, you know, it went exactly like I thought it would. You know, people, you know, every little site and blog and, 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 and Twitter page, you know, retweeted, attacked WWE. Oh, WWE doesn't require people to have knowledge of the product. And this is so bad. And rah, 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 you know, all of that. And it turned into this ridiculous firestorm. She had no idea it was coming, and it cost her her job. I knew it was going to cost her her job, because if we know nothing else about WWE, we know they're petty, very petty. And so when news of this circulated, trickled up 
up the ladder to Stephanie McMahon or Vince McMahon or whoever. This probably doesn't make it to Vince McMahon's desk. But as soon as it got up the ladder far enough, she had to go. And so they fired her. And, you know, is it her fault? I guess. But I think the bigger fault here lies in the lap of WWE. Because when you hire someone, listen, if you're going to hire people who are not familiar with the wrestling bubble, with how thirsty fans are for any wrestling content, with the toxicity that exists among wrestling fans for any and every opportunity to bash your company or your product. If you're going to hire people who are not familiar with that, then it's your job to make them aware of that. It's your job to make sure they understand that. It's your job to make sure that the people who work on your product maintain an integrity of your product to make sure they know who the main characters are, what their names are, right? What are their storylines? What's important to say or not say publicly? That is the company's job. When you hire people, they have to know what is and isn't okay. There's a lot of companies that you could work for and you could talk about how silly it is to work there and not get fired. WWE is not one of those companies, but they should make sure people know that when they hire them. So this young lady lost her job. I'm I'm hoping she'll recover and, you know, end up somewhere else. I mean, listen, the truth is the rest of the the majority of the media production world still looks at wrestling as being silly. So People aren't going to say, oh, WWE didn't work out for you. We're not going to hire you. That's just not going to happen because people don't value, right, WWE's uh, input in that way. So she'll be fine. You know, uh, you know, it's, it's still a pandemic, you know, and, and jobs are not growing on trees. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm hoping for the best for her because unlike some of the wrestlers, I don't think she's going to get the 90-day non, non-compete uh, compact clause and severance package. So, you know, she's going to need to work as soon as possible. So hopefully that works out for her well. Um, But yeah, ultimately, this is a company failure, man. It's a company failure. And, um, you know, you can't really tell fans to stop being so toxic because that's like telling uh, a lion not to eat uh, or telling a fish not to swim. (laughs) Wrestling fans, going to be wrestling fans. This week on the show, we got some furthering of the storylines as we move along the road towards Slammiversary. We got about four weeks to go, so they got to try to, you know, flush out and develop more of these storylines, you know, again, in order to create some big match feel. I ask people a lot of times, would they rather see a great match or an okay match that has an excellent story build? Me, I'm going to take an okay match that has an excellent story build 10 times out of 10. Give me the story because that makes the payoff matter, all right? So this part of the of the, the process, the leading up to the pay-per-view, is so important because the story has to matter. You dig, all right? So this week on the show, we started off seeing Don Callis having a little trouble getting into the building. The security guard stops him as he's coming in. Uh, Don is walking in with Kenny Omega, and the security guard is, you know, giving him a little bit of hard time. He says, hey, look, you're not on the EVP list. Uh, you know, whatever, and Don just loses it. He loses it and cuts a mean promo on this guy. I'm the five-time Canadian heavyweight champion. I booked Kenny Omega and Chris Jericho at the, the, the Tokyo Dome and all of this. And I'm sitting here watching this and just thinking to myself, man, we have all seen that person who just loses it on some poor cashier or waiter or waitress or bartender over nothing and you're just sitting there thinking like, man, this, this this person's just at work doing their job and this jerk just is going flying off the handles. You know what I mean? This is the person at McDonald's in a in a sports coat um, <laughs> yelling at the teenager behind the cash register about not honoring their coupon, okay? Or not putting enough onions on their cheeseburger, right? Like this is, we've all seen that person and we all think that person is a complete and total jerk. So congratulations, Don Callis, you uh, projected a very real dummy, jerk. I don't even know what you want to call it, but Don Callis, phenomenal job, phenomenal job right there. First match we got was Rosemary against Kara Hogan. Kara Hogan is getting better and better. Every time we see Kara Hogan, she's just doing such 
such an improved job of presenting her character as a bad girl, as a tough girl, as somebody who is like really threatening. And she just really is just killing it with the swag and the sass and all of that stuff. And she's just so much more confident putting it out there. And, I, you know, I say it again. I think Tasha Steele's being added to the mix helps so much. Listen, it's tough being the only black person in the room, right? Like, especially, or being the only black woman in the room too, because you feel like people maybe don't understand you when you want to say period or whatever it is, right? Like, and so I think adding Tasha Steele, who just came in with this abundance of confidence and swag and, you know, you can't tell me nothing attitude, that has helped Kira Hogan find herself and find her voice and find her character so much better. And it's a beautiful thing to see. Unfortunately, it didn't help out in her match against Rosemary because Rosemary beat her clean in the middle of the ring. This is leading to a setup of Rosemary and Havoc, the new tag team, uh, challenging Fire and Flavor for the Knockouts Tag Team Championship. I don't know if that match is booked yet, but we all know it's coming. Come on, let's be realistic here. Um, we, got, we saw a backstage promo with Chris Bay telling Gia Miller that he's not going to choose a side in this X Division beef that's going on. He said his job is to stay cool, stay in the cut like Neosporin, count paper, and focus on going to Slammiversary to become a two-time, two-time X Division champion. He gets interrupted by Petey Williams and Trey Miguel, and, you know, they're basically telling him, look, dude, you got to pick a side. You know, it's, it's getting hot out here, and you got to pick a side. Petey had, had a good line here. He said, look, you got to pick a side before a side picks you. And we would see more on this development later in the show. Next, we see Tommy Dreamer backstage with Gia Miller. Man, she's just all over the place, right? She's over here interviewing this person. Next, she's over here interviewing this person. Um, Tommy Dreamer backstage with Gia Miller, and he's saying that he thought what, had, what he had to do to Don Callis last week it just needed to be done. Um, Scott Demore walks up and he says, thank you to Tommy Dreamer. Tommy Dreamer tells him, listen, I'll be here. I'll have your back and I'll be overseeing things. And Scott says, he's not quite sure how much Tommy needs to oversee things. Tommy reminds uh, Scott that Anthem has hired him as a consultant and he'll be staying on in that role. So, you can see the formation of a little bit of a storyline there, which I kind of like the idea. If you're going to use Tommy Dreamer, using him as some sort of an on-screen authority figure, I think that's actually a perfect role for him. Um, Tommy Dreamer is an excellent talker. He's only gotten better as years have gone on, and Tommy Dreamer can pull an emotional promo out of his tailpipe like that, right? Like, Tommy Dreamer is good. He's, he's excellent at pro wrestling. I just don't want to see him wrestle. You know what I mean? Like, it is what it is. It's, it's nothing against Tommy Dreamer. It's just that for Impact Wrestling, I want to see who's next, right? I want to see who's going to take this company and become an attraction that's going to make me want to go in my pocket and come see you when you come to my town, right? And it's not Tommy Dreamer. I love you, Tommy. I don't, you know, but I'm not I'm not going out of my way uh, driving somewhere and buying a ticket to see Tommy Dreamer do anything. I'm not. I'm sorry. I'm not. All right. Now, Deanna Perrazzo went up against Susan, and I mean, listen, did anybody have any doubt as to how this match was going to play out? But here's where, where they made it interesting, and you got to give these guys credit. Nobody had any doubt on how this match would go. Um, but Deanna Perrazzo made this a very, very vicious beating. Like, you know, she just whooped Susan all around the ring. You know, she could have finished her two or three times. And she was pulling her hair up from the mat and just saying, I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to finish her that easy. You know, eventually she gets her in the arm bar and Susan taps out and then Deanna won't let the arm bar go. She's cranking way back on it to the point where Kimberly has to get in the ring and, 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 and kind of break it up. But then Deanna's basically cussing out Kimberly, telling her you're a loser. You know, you, you guys never deserve to be with me. And, like, listen, this was a great job of making Deanna look like a super-duper heel, you know? And and I got to give her credit, man. Like, it's not – so bear with me. This comparison is going to seem a little bit weird, but just bear with me here. Let me flush it out. This reminds me a little bit of John Cena's run in WWE from about – you know, what, 06, 07 to like, you know, 2015, 
when it's not that there was no one else there, but they just weren't building around anyone else. So it minimized everyone else, right? And you kind of have something like that here in Impact where they're building around Deanna. They're consistently trying to make her look strong. And that's tough, right? It's tough to look like a superstar when they're not giving you other people who look strong to work with. And so you got to really stomp people. You got to grind them into the dirt to really emphasize how big and bad you are. And to Deanna Perrazzo's credit, she is doing that. She is minimizing, stomping, and crushing everybody they put in the ring with her. And all it's saying is that she's that much higher above all the other knockouts. Um, whether you feel that's true or not doesn't matter. Because apparently that's how Impact feels. And Deanna Perrazzo is delivering on the role that they're putting her in. So that's to her credit. Now, Deanna actually tweeted something that I thought was interesting. She had a she had a post that said something about the best... Um, the words written were, I think, the best technical women's wrestler in the world. And then she did the strike through thing where it looks like the words crossed out to where it just said the best in the world. And... Listen, Deanna Perrazzo wants to start calling her, the her herself the best in the world. I don't have a problem with it. I think it's tough, though. I think it's going to be a tough sell for fans around the world for Deanna Perrazzo to call herself the best in the world when the Knockouts roster doesn't have anybody else right now who can really lay claim to that. The Knockouts roster has good, talented women on it, but it doesn't have anyone else on that roster right now who could even be in the conversation for being one of the best in the world. And again, flashback to this time last summer, you had Deanna Perrazzo, you had Kylie Ray, you had Taya Valkyrie, you had Jordan Grace. You know, these are all people that, that could be in the conversation for some of the best women wrestlers in the business. And right now, the Knockouts roster is just looking, you know, so incredibly thin, which I mean, my goodness. You had to take Susan, you basically had to take Deanna Perrazzo and put her against her two goons because you don't have, you know, more challengers for her. So they need to figure this, this roster out and figure out some, some challengers for Deanna Perrazzo because you don't want her to waste her time here, okay? I, I know she recently re-signed her contract, but you got to make this time count. If, if you're going to keep building Deanna Perrazzo, you need to make her into an attraction. The next time she steps in front of fans, she needs to be getting rained and showered with booze, okay? Because she just has been such a, 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 a jerk, right? Such a, a, a dominating heel that nobody likes her. You just want to see her get beaten so badly. So they got to find her some good, credible competition. <clears throat> All right. Next, we went to Swinger's Palace. And <laughs> listen... Swingers Palace is not necessarily the best place to make matches, but that's what it's been used for. So on this edition of Swingers Palace, uh, it was TJP and Falaba. They're sitting at the blackjack counter and they're, you know, they're gambling. And then Rich Swan and Willie Mack come up. And, you know, there's this whole thing, Rich Mac, Rich Swan showing his shoes, uh, uh, Johnny Bravo showing his shoes, and you know, this eventually leads to a tag team challenge from Rich Swan and Willie Mack against uh, TJP and Fala Bob. And that was the whole purpose of the segment. I mean, the, the, the dialogue was fine. I, I, I do like how uh, TJP says to them, are you guys even still a tag team? And Rich Swan's like, well, you know, I had a leg injury, had to battle back, then I had a world title run, right? And uh, then Fala Bob goes, I had a gambling addiction, right? <laughs> so um, so it was cool, man. It, it, it's like they're making fun of themselves, right? Like, you know, because fans aren't stupid, right? So at least acknowledge that. I appreciate that as a fan. Next, we got to see Tommy Dreamer get approached by Don Callis backstage and challenge him to a six-man tag. It'll be Team Dreamer versus Team Callis, right? Tommy Dreamer agrees to it. Uh, they shake hands, and Don tells Dreamer, this will be a great way to end your career. So I think the assumption on Don Callis' part is that Tommy Dreamer would be a part of the six-man match. It, I got to check the graphic. Is Tommy Dreamer scheduled to be a part of the six-man match? I don't know. Let me, let me just let me look up because I, like, I felt like when I saw the match graphic, it was not Tommy Dreamer 
a part of the match. Let me just do some investigation. 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 Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Search the old Impact Wrestling Twitter Twitter account. Let's get up the match graphic for next week. And let's see what we got here. Yeah, okay. It says the Good Brothers and Kenny Omega versus Moose Callahan. And it says Saban. Huh. Interesting. I didn't did, did they add Chris Saban during the show? When did that happen? All right. Anyway. So, yeah, I, I, I think that the assumption by Tommy Dreamer was that the uh was 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 that it would be uh, the assumption by Don Callis was that Tommy Dreamer would be in the match because he wanted to see Tommy Dreamer get beat up for being the one who fired him last week. But J Tommy Dreamer is not going to be in the match. So, again, to me, great use of Tommy Dreamer. Use him as a talker. Use him as a catalyst, as a conduit, if you will. And, uh, you know, make other people hot and get us some good action. All right. We got Shira and Rohit versus Petey Williams and Trey Miguel. Uh, Rohit got the pin on Petey Williams after a drive-by kick. Um, then Ace Austin and Madman Fulton came down to the ring and started beating up Petey and Trey. Then Josh Alexander comes out, and then all the bad guys in the ring take out Josh Alexander, so he's there getting beat down. And then who should come out but Chris Bay? And instead of going in and picking a side, he starts to take a selfie. He pulls out his phone and basically, you know... Everybody's in the ring fighting behind him, and he's just, you know, like, taking a selfie, like, making fun of it, and I thought that was so dope. That was so good. Chris Bay is setting himself up as, like, the main bad guy, the main antagonist of this whole storyline, and I think that's great, right? I think that's great. Like, he's going to be the person. He needs to be the person who's set aside. Whether he's the champion or not, having him be the person that the story is kind of built around, I think is great. Now, as we know, right, this is all leading up to uh, to an Ultimate X match at Slammiversary, which I think is interesting. I, I, I don't think Josh Alexander should lose the title um, because, as I mentioned before, I think Josh Alexander may actually be on track to be the one who wins that title from Kenny Omega. And if he is, I think that would be a great thing for Impact Wrestling, for Impact Wrestling's fans, and for Josh Alexander. I think that would, you know, make him a star. You know what I mean? When's the last time Impact actually made a star? Um but being that, gosh, this would have to happen in Bound for Glory. That would be October. They, they kind of have to have to hot shot it. So if you remember the way that Austin Aries' big title push went, Austin Aries was on impact week after week, defending his title, just beating people. Um, he was at pay-per-view after pay-per-view, just, you know, just beating people. And it seemed like it was about a year that Austin Aries was just running through pretty much everybody they put in front of him before he stepped up and said, hey, Bobby Roode's over there. Nobody can touch him. Nobody can touch me. I think I need to go after him. And so if they're going to do that same thing with Josh Alexander, then they, they have to speed up the process just a little bit. I mean, listen, October seems like a long way away, but it'll be here before you know it. So what needs to happen if Josh Alexander is going to be the person to take that title off of Kenny Omega at Bound for Glory, Josh Alexander, he's got to be, he's, he's got to heat up and he's got to just keep going through challengers, 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 challengers until the fans unanimously look up and say, that's the guy. That's the guy. Nobody else can beat him. He's got this X Division title. He needs to be the one to challenge Kenny Omega. You can't rush it too much because the fans have to say it. In order for this to work, this, this can't be something where the fans are just trying to figure it out, right? Just trying to figure out where the story is going. The fans themselves have to be convinced that this is the guy with the best, most realistic shot to bring that title off Kenny Omega and back to Impact Wrestling. So, um, so you know, the Ultimate X needs to happen. Josh Alexander has to win, right? Next challenger, Josh Alexander has to win. Next challenger, Josh Alexander has to win, right? It's just It just has to be that way. And you can do that without making everybody else in the X Division look weak. You just got to continuously make him look strong. 
banger match after banger match after banger match. It has to happen, and it can happen. You just got to take your time and let it play out. But it's totally doable. I can totally see, you know, this uh, see, see this working out that way with Josh Alexander getting the Austin Aries push. All right. Rachel Ellering came to the ring all alone, and she started pouring her heart out. Now, I'm not going to lie. I started off just looking at this segment going, oh, cringe, cringe, cringe. Because I haven't seen enough of Rachel Ellering to feel good about a promo when I see her getting ready to make a promo. But she did a good job, man. She she, she poured her heart out. She said something emotional. She looked like she was going to cry a little bit. Um, excuse me. She said that la this point last year, she was at her lowest point ever in her life. And she said that people kept trying to push positivity on her. And what she's realized is that she was actually doing the same thing to Jordan Grace. And... She said that she had been, um, she had been wearing rose-colored glasses ever since her and Jordan won the Knockouts Tag Titles. And when you wear rose-colored glasses, you can't see the red flag. I thought that was a good line. So she calls Jordan Grace out, and <clears throat> she basically tells this to her. She says, "Jordan, <clears throat> you're letting people like Tanil Dashwood get in your head." Ah. <clears throat> Swig of coffee for the working man. And this makes Jordan mad. Jordan is not happy with the idea that Rachel thinks that uh, Tennille Dashwood is getting in Jordan's head. And then she she basically tells Jordan, hey, I'm, she, uh, Jordan basically tells Rachel, hey, before you got here, I was doing pretty good. I beat the longest reigning knockouts champion to become the knockouts champion. Shout out to Ty Valkyrie. Shout out to Recall. Shout out to actually acting like wrestling fans have a, me have a memory. Good job, Jordan Grace. And by the way, this is the first time we've got to see any real character development from Jordan Grace. So I like this too. Like Jordan Grace, she's been putting matches on the books, right? So we know she can wrestle, but I need character. I need character. I need to try to understand like, when I see this person, what are they thinking? What are they going to try to do, right? When you see Chris Bay, you know he's going to try to finesse something, right? When you see Jordan Grace, what do you really know, right? So this is the first time we've actually gotten some good quality character development out of Jordan Grace. And, uh, you know, Rachel Ellering keeps trying to be nice to her. Jordan's getting angrier and angrier as Rachel's trying to be nice to her. And then Jazz comes out. Didn't see that one coming. And, you know, Jazz comes out here and she basically tries to talk some sense into him. She's like, hey, you know, I thought you guys would be a good match together. That's why I put you two together. And you guys need to figure out if you're going to make it work or not. And Jordan's like, ah, I don't know. I need some time. So Jordan walks off. Then as Jordan walks off, another surprise person comes out. Tanil Dashwood with Caleb with a K. And Tanil basically gets in the ring and she says to, to Rachel, she's like, hey, why are you still doing this? You could have had me as a partner. And Rachel's like, no, no, hell no. She said, the only time I wanted to be in the ring with you, Tanil, is when you're my opponent. And so they basically make a match and a fight breaks out. Tanil leaves, uh, she gives, uh, excuse me, Rachel gives Tanil the Farouk Spine Buster. I think she might have sat down with it, but it was still, it, it looked really cool. And uh, Tanil rolls out of the ring, and Caleb basically carries her away like she was dead. Like, you know, what he, you know what he did? He carried her the way that Hulk Hogan carried Miss Elizabeth back to the ring and uh, back to the to, to the to the to the locker room on Saturday night's main event with uh, before he got attacked by Macho Man. And, uh, so that was funny. She was acting like she was dead. But listen, <clears throat> major kudos to this segment. I came into the segment preparing to hate it. I'm not a huge fan of just talking segments. Um, and also, you know, I still feel like Rachel Ellering is like, you know, very much developing. So I don't know enough of her character to trust that I'm going to get something good when she has the microphone. So I was ready to hate this segment. But kudos to everybody involved. This was really good. This was really good. We got character development from Rachel Ellering. We got character development from Jordan Grace. We got to see Jazz. We got to see Tanil continue her character development. I mean, this was good. This was really good for everybody all around. I love when I don't know what to expect from a segment. 
right? Don't have a, the, a, the, an idea specifically of what to expect from a segment, and the segment over delivers. And that's what happened here. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. So, kudos to everybody involved here. All right. We got to see Sam Bill with Brian Myers versus Jake something. I like what they're doing with Sam Bill and Brian Myers. Uh, <clears throat> Sam Bill, again, he's a developing guy. So give him a storyline where we're showing him develop, right? We got to see Brian Myers actually in this role when he was an, an edge head, right? When it was Brian Myers and uh, Zack Ryder, you know, when they were following around edge and like, what was that? 2007, 2008 on SmackDown. But that was a great role, right? So in this role, they're kind of making fun of that, but we are still actually getting to see the development of Sam Bill. So this is pretty cool. We got to see him like do more, you know, he had a different style entrance today and all that other stuff. Um, Jake something won as he should have. Uh, he had a, a, a sidewalk slam, but he sat down with it. It was a good, nice looking move. After the match, Brian Myers tells Sam at a time like this, you have to find someone else to blame. And he tells Jake something that he's not a professional. Uh, he tells Sam, everything you see Jake do, do the opposite. All right, so that was good. Uh, good character work for Brian Myers. I think they might be cooling him off a little bit. Uh, it's, it's, it's tough. You know, everybody's got to find something to do. Everybody can't be in the world title picture every every minute. Um, but you got to be careful. Be careful, Brian Myers. Don't let him get too lost in doing this to where, uh, you know, to where people don't 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 care about seeing him wrestle. You know what I mean? Because he was definitely, he, he's rising. Everything Brian Myers has done to this point has been excellent. All right, backstage, <coughs> excuse me. Backstage, we see Eddie Edwards and Kojima warming up for the tag team main event. And Rich Swan and Willie Mack walk up. And uh, Rich Swan and and, uh, and and Willie Mack, they tell Eddie Edwards and, and Kojima, hey, if you guys win the titles, we want the first shot. And Rich Swan says, hey, I'm still a little banged up from running in W. Morrissey. And Eddie says, Morrissey will get what he's got coming to him. So that's an interesting little seed they got planted right there, right? What's next for W. Morrissey? I don't think we saw him this week, so we don't know what's going to be next for him. Then we got our main event. It was Diener and Joe Doring against Eddie Edwards and Kojima. Good match. High level of wrestling going on here. Uh, Diener and Joe Doring got the win and re retained the titles. This is a good main event. It was good wrestling. Um... You know, Violet by Design, they're just kind of there for me. I don't know. Nothing about them really excites me, but they're a heel, a heel faction. I don't know how exciting they're supposed to be. They're definitely serving their purpose, though. Um, you know, they're they're winning, so they don't look weak, and they're having good matches. So I don't know what more you can really ask for them on that front. So, um, you know, shout out to those guys. It was a solid main event, um, but it was kind of just there. You know what I mean? It was kind of just there. It was It was wrestling for the sake of wrestling. Now it's time for a segment I like to call World Title Watch, where I look at the path and the comings and goings of the Impact World Title because it's in the hands of Kenny Omega, who could be any and everywhere around the globe because he has 17 titles right now. I think he's the champion of everything except WWE. And uh, where's the Impact title? And who might possibly get it back? So this week we saw some interesting things. As I mentioned earlier, with the making of the six-man tag match between uh, Tommy Dreamer and, um, I'm sorry, Team Dreamer and Team Callis, we're keeping Moose in the picture, right? Moose is still very upset about the way he lost to Kenny Omega with the assistance of the Young Bucks, and that keeps him close to the situation. Listen, Sammy Callahan is getting the title shot at anniversary, but I don't see Sammy Callahan winning it. Sammy Callahan is an impact guy, and I wouldn't be mad at Sammy Callahan as the champion. I just don't see it, man. I just don't see it. With all the people that Kenny Omega is beating, it just doesn't seem this doesn't seem feasible that Sammy Callahan is gonna be the guy, right? Like he doesn't have enough clout built up to say that he's the guy who's gonna beat Kenny Omega, right? Um I Again, I thought Moose had a chance to be that guy because he had gone on, you know, something like a two-year undefeated pay-per-view winning streak right and he promptly lost two or three matches in a row and now moose is hanging on by a thread and i still like the idea of josh alexander 
running with the X Division title, becoming an unstoppable force, and being the person to finally take that title off Kenny Omega. I think if you do that, then you make a star. Then you can let Moose challenge Josh Alexander for the title later. Um, but I think right now, I think Josh Alexander at Bound for Glory should be the guy to take the title off Kenny Omega. Um, you know, Slammiversary, the idea of, of, of Kenny Omega versus Sammy Callahan at Slammiversary, I, listen, I may buy it, I may not. But I'm certainly not, like, intrigued that I need to see this match. Um, it, as far as anybody else, I don't know. You know, and then, look, it's July, right? It's July. After Kenny Omega beats Sammy Callahan at Slammiversary, what are they going to do between now and October with the title? So, you know, is Moose going to challenge again? You know, what what what, what are they going to That's a lot of months in between now and October. I think October is the time when it happens. I think it's October, and I think it's going to be Josh Alexander, or it could still be Moose. Moose still feels like the most credible challenger, but the Josh Alexander proposition, I think, will make him, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking forward, right? Like Moose today is the most credible challenger to Kenny Omega, but he already lost to him. But if you follow the Josh Alexander plan, he can be the star you want to take the title and bring it back to Impact Wrestling by Bound for Glory. So I'm very interested to see, you know, where it's going to go, um, who else could be a potential challenger in the way? I don't know, man. After Slammiversary, when, you know, Sammy Callahan's out of picture, what are they going to do? Eddie Edwards? You know what I mean? I, they're, they're running out of guys. They're running out of guys. So, you know, the world title watch is, uh, is an interesting one right now. But it feels like we got a long way between now and Bound for Glory, which is when I predict the, the, the change is going to happen. Now it's time for your favorite part of the show. This is the part where you get to be part of the show with your comments on the YouTube page. Um, again, if you don't know, all you got to do is below this video, drop your name, where you're from, and leave a comment, and I will respond to your comment. Um, maybe not all of the comments, but at least some of them, at least the good ones. I'm not going to repeat question after question on the same topic, but if you got good, interesting thoughts on the show, drop them down here. And we're going to talk about it, okay? All right. So let's get into it. Last show I brought you guys was about two weeks ago. So we should have a good amount of comments to sift through here. All right. So, ooh, Lee, Impact Wrestling supporter, says, The Iron Man match between Josh Alexander and TJP was a classic. Proud of both of them and making the X Division great again. Uh, I loved your comment up until the last part. I mean, just the way that... The way you phrase that, just some other things and some great again, just, you could have said something different. All right. Uh, Bold Shades 98 says, with Samoa Joe most likely going to NXT, we've seen that he actually is back in NXT, the only talents that could show up at Slammiversary are talents like Wesley Blake, Chelsea Green, the Iconics. Those talents are not exactly the game changer for Impact. They should have just had what matches will be at Slammiversary because now it looks really lame, especially if that best talent, if that's the best talent they can bring in. Um, all right, I, I think that's I, I think that's that's interesting, right? Like none of those names are really gonna move the needle, right? Like um last year it did really feel like a big deal, even though they didn't get, you know, they didn't get a ton of big time comebacks or debuts at Slammiversary. You know, ending the show with EC3, I thought was great. Um, Eric Young coming back was, it, you know, it's turned out to be a significant con contributor over the past year. Uh, who else showed up? The Motor City Machine Guns. That was fun for a couple of weeks. And um, yeah, you know, so just just give it time, guys. Just give it time to, to see how it goes. I don't, agree, I, I don't disagree with you that the names left aren't necessarily a, a big deal. But think about it like this, right? If uh, the former Ruby Riot, if she were to show up at Slammiversary, and if um, Chelsea Green were to show up at Slammiversary, right there, you have instantly made your knockouts division a lot more competitive, a lot more personality, a lot more name recognition. That's two people who were, you know, bottom feeders in WWE because they weren't being used, and they would instantly make 
the knockouts division a lot better. So a lot of it is about how you get used, okay? And for that, we're going to have to wait and see how it plays out. So, you know, let's just give it time. Um, if there's one thing I think that Impact has earned is they've earned the benefit of the doubt on how they're going to use a lot of people. Um, also, I think when they injected new talent into the roster last year, I think it made it very competitive for the people who are already here, and it just brings out the best in everybody. So um, I'm excited and looking forward to see who actually shows up at Slammiversary. All right. All right. Vonville says Braun Strowman will go new, to New Japan. The last thing he wants to be is uh, is is to have a joke. It, last thing he wants to be is a joke. Having competitive twenty minute matches with Marco Stunt, uh, Ruby Garrett, Ruby Riot, and Santana Garrett will sign with Impact. Lana will go to AEW. I don't know. We'll see. All right. Brandon Sk Brandon Skiandra says. Impact should never get rid of the X Division Championship. After all the after all the changes Impact has gone through, the X Division Championship has been the constant. A KOTM match at Slammiversary for the X Division Championship would be awesome, though. Josh, Sammy, Eddie, Saban, and Swan. So, um, this is in response to what I said about Josh Alexander and his comment saying that he's the king of the mountain around Impact until the world title comes back. And I also have been saying for a long time that I don't know that there's truly a place for the X Division in today's world of wrestling because this all goes back to Monday Nitro when Eric Bischoff introduced the Cruiserweights who had a different wrestling style than the heavyweights at the top of the card and they, made, they added a new exciting element to the show. But right now, if most of your roster wrestles that Cruiserweight style of, 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 of performance then it doesn't look unique. And so that's created a challenge, right, for the X Division to feel unique. And um, I think it's still possible to let the X Division Championship feel like something special. And by the way, Josh Alexander is doing that. It takes a star, okay? It takes a star to change the perception. Josh Alexander is going out having bust-ass matches and... He's making the X Division title feel like a big deal because he's starting to feel like a big deal. And that's making all the difference. All right. Malcolm Lloyd says, fans are back and things are slowly getting back to normal. It will definitely feel good to hear real crowd voices. Couldn't agree with you more. They're going to pack in probably, you know, 200 people into Skyway Studios for uh, Slammiversary. But it will be welcome, man. It will be welcome. I hope... However many people they get in there, I hope they are loud and excited and energetic. And I hope they leave that show feeling like they just wrestled a match. I hope they give all the energy to this product that hasn't been there for the past year and some change and just makes Impact feel like a totally different show. All right, it says, this has to be a running joke with Tasha and Kiera. They've been wrestling Havoc for over a year and want to face new opponents, but somehow are still feuding with Havoc. Also, who is going to face Deanna since she has defeated pretty much everybody on the roster? Uh, this is from Bland Skies 28 a consistent contributor to the comment section. Thank you very much. I agree. I agree. Um, listen, the Knockouts roster is very thin. This is why, you know, in addition of a group like the, the former Iconics, uh, in addition of someone like Ruby Riot, in addition of Chelsea Green, would be very much welcome because they need more people with presence on this roster. They got to figure out a way to make it feel more fun, make it feel more competitive. I think if they can get back to, you know, doing shows, BQ had an excellent idea probably two years ago where he suggested that the Knockouts Tag Team Championships should travel to different independent shows and they should just go around defending them against, you know, random groups of uh, independent wrestlers. And I think that'd be great, you know, once we get back to a place where people feel comfortable being around, you know, people, you know, vaccinations or not, um, I, I think that'll be a great way to promote those knockouts tag team titles. It'll be a, a fun way to use them, but we're, we're not there yet. So let's just, let's just hold off and see where that goes. But yeah, look, the knockouts division needs depth. It needs depth. It needs an, an infusion of talent. All right. <laughs> Rock Cold Dwayne Austin says, I don't entirely agree with you on the Good Brothers. I thought they were kind of cool when they first came to Impact, but now they're totally lame 
and being nothing more than sidekicks to Kenny Omega and Don, a.k.a. the Geek and his uncle figure. Um, look, man, I don't know what to tell you, man. Like, a lot of people think that the, uh, a lot of people think that the Good Brothers are cool. Um, I don't. I don't have anything against them, right? I don't have anything against them. I just, they haven't earned all the cachet that they get presented with. Right, people are like, oh, the Good Brothers, they're gonna do their thing, and blah, blah, blah. right. I didn't, I, I didn't watch New Japan, so I don't know them from New Japan. So you have to always present for as if somebody's watching your product for the first time. Don't ever assume that people know you from your previous stop. I had this conversation with Adam Cole, baby, fans all the time, right? They tell me about how great Adam Cole is and all this other stuff. And I always say to them, like, yo, like, okay, look, if you're just basing Adam Cole off of, if you didn't see Adam Cole before he came to NXT, would you be a fan of Adam Cole outside of the fact that people like him, right? People like people who people like, right? Like, it's a thing. Right? When he goes, Adam Cole, baby, right? Like, everybody loves that. It's a lot of fun. But, uh, I mean, I don't know. I'm just saying, like, for, for all of the love people have for Adam Cole, I think he's fine. He's okay. You know what I mean? Like, I, I, I don't think he's bad, but, you know, people just... Now, he cooked Karrion Cross in a promo, like, three weeks ago, and that was, like, that really stung. And it, what made it even worse was Karrion Cross came out on one of the other shows, I think it was main event, without Scarlett and without his NXT entrance, and he looked super plain Jane. Super plain Jane. And so I think Adam Cole did him a little dirty in that promo, but um, which is a credit to Adam Cole, okay, good, good for him. But this is just again another example of people c carrying their credibility from other shows into a new show. And if I haven't seen that other show, I'm not gonna give you credit for what I saw before. Now, listen, I've been totally guilty of that, right? When Samoa Joe showed up in WWE, I'm already a fan from watching Impact. When AE, when AJ Styles showed up in WWE. I was already a fan from watching Impact. And I'm telling everybody, you know, oh, this guy's dope. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, So we're all guilty of it. But as someone who didn't watch New Japan, doesn't watch New Japan, I'm not going to give you credit for how cool you were in New Japan because it doesn't matter to me. I don't watch that show, right? So I need to see, if you're cool, I need to see you be cool right here, right now. And I haven't seen it yet from the Good Brothers. I mean, whatever. It is what it is. All right. Let's see. Um, Malcolm Lloyd, again, says, I agree with the tournament style of matches for the X Division week to week leading up to Bound for Glory, adding a few more wrestlers to it, and I know they'll excel. Um, I think that's a great, again, uh, yeah, I think that's a great idea, obviously because I said it, but you got to find a way to present the X Division that makes the fans say, yes, X Division, right? Not like, Oh, X Division. I know I'm going to get a bunch of flips and no selling and a multi-man match. woo Right? Like, because that's where where it's it's become. They've minimized it to how much of a spot fest spectacle can we create in this X Division space on the card when it needs to be, I care about this, at, <clears throat> this character. I care about this character. I care about this character. Oh, my God. You're getting all four of those guys in the ring at once. Oh, my God. This is going to be great. Right? But we're not there because they don't, they're don't they not taking the time to develop these guys. And listen, if all they can do is be great wrestlers, fine. Put them on TV. Give them the one spot on the show where we're going to get a kick-ass 10-minute match that is going to make us say both guys busted it and gave it all they could in that 10-minute match. And it's going to be memorable week after week after week. Make that the X Division style. But you got to have something that is the signature X Division style. Otherwise, it's just a belt to, to, call, to be called X Division for the sake of calling it X Division. Uh, Danielle Wolf says, I am loving this. If you're talking about me, then thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm loving this too. <laughs> All right. Uh, Carter Inc. says, the Iron Man match was outstanding. If Omega had had AV been in that match, Meltzer and all the <laughs> if Omega had been in the match, uh, Meltzer and all the Omega marks would have been calling it one of the matches of the decade and giving it six stars. 
You're not wrong. You're not wrong. It is what it is. I mean, like, we know that, you know, journalism in general is biased, and especially wrestling journalism. So it is what it is. All right. Packed Entertainment. Thanks, Packed Entertainment. says, Impact desperately needs to start singing people or signing people to five-year contracts instead of two years. It's very frustrating to worry if stars will re-sign after two years. And he also says, I don't think Impact will ever retire the X Division Championship. I also hope they don't ever do it. It's one of the things that define the company. All right, thank you for your comment, Pact Entertainment. Um, you know, the length of the contract, it would be better. I think the thing that's more interesting to me that I'd like to see from Impact is start signing their stars to exclusive deals. I don't care if they're one year, two year, three year, five year, whatever, but... I don't like the idea that I can see a match with Trey Miguel and, I don't know, some other great independent star. Let's say Trey Miguel and Leo Rush, right? I don't like the idea that I can see that match on an independent show, and I can't see that on Impact, right? So Impact needs to pay these guys enough to where they don't wrestle independent dates, okay? Um and they need to sign them to exclusive deals because if you don't have any, if you can't present and offer any exclusive matches, I think that hurts the product a lot. And I think that's been like a thing that has hurt them a lot. So regardless of what the length of the deal is, for that amount of time, I should only be able to see you on impact. I think that would help the, the product a lot, just creating some scarcity, right, of the fact that you can only see these wrestlers on this show. I think that would be a, a, a big deal. All right, I'm going to take one or two more. Let me just scroll through here and find some good ones. Oh, okay, here's a good one from Luke Avery. Luke Avery asks, now that Impact Wrestling has announced that fans will be welcomed back at Slammiversary, do you think they will sell tickets for the television tapings after Slammiversary? Do you think they will only have fans at big pay-per-views for the rest of this year? Great question, Luke. Great question. I My hope as a fan is that they'll just start Go, they'll, they'll just start going back on tour and getting the show back in front of fans. It makes the show infinitely better. You know, again, it's tough. We still live in the times of COVID. Um, I think in the U.S., something like 70% of adults are vaccinated right now, but that's still 30% that aren't vaccinated, right? And it only takes one person to spread it, right? So, you know, if, you, if you're going to tell me you can go into – I'm vaccinated, by the way um, – not not encouraging anybody else to do it or don't do it. I'm just saying me personally. So if I'm going to go somewhere, you're going to tell me 70% of the people there are vaccinated, I'm still going to be wearing a mask and trying to distance from people. Because, again, like, it only takes one person to infect everyone. So, um, you know, we're not out of the woods with COVID yet. I would like to see them have fans back at the shows, get back on the road touring, but you still got to be careful, man. You still got to be careful. Um, you know, I don't know what the um, what the the legal liability would be for the company if they start touring and their wrestlers start getting sick. You know, also, you know, can Impact afford to send somebody home for two weeks while they have to quarantine? You know, can they afford to lose somebody off their show for, for two weeks while they go home and deal with COVID? We don't know. So um, I think it's still, uh, if I had to guess... I think if they were going to go back on tour, we would see some for sale dates right now. So they're probably not going to go back on tour right away. Um, are they going to start having fans at Skyway Studios more permanently? I don't know. I'd like to. Again, I'd like to see it. Just because it adds to the show a lot, a lot. And I think the, the, the wrestlers in Impact deserve to perform in front of fans too. You know, um, these wrestlers go out there, they work hard, you know, they bust their tails, and they deserve to be performing in front of people. So... I'd like to see Impact have the show in front of people every week going forward, but who knows, right? You got to do what's in the best interest of your company and of your talent. All right, one more. Let's see what we got here. Lots of comments on the X Division. You guys, that's a, that's a hot topic with everybody. Okay, King Nerd says, 
I think it's more likely that Alexander is the one to dethrone, dethrone Omega rather than replacing the X Division belt. And to who and to and to hell with option C. I want him to challenge Omega, win, and carry all three belts except the AEW title. Um, listen, that's a good that's a good option. Listen, I, I think I think doing it this way honestly would be the best thing for Impact going forward because then you would have the man on your roster who defeated and dethroned Kenny Omega. So automatically the person at the top of your roster would have the cachet of saying he defeated Kenny Omega for the Impact World title. And if you add that on to having gone undefeated for months and months and months with the X Division title and, you know, kicking it off with, you know, this Iron Man match. And then he's about to put a, a, a an Ultimate X match, you know, uh, on the board at Slammiversary. So, listen, just keep building Josh Alexander and I think you could have something really, really dope on your hands come October. All right? Yes, we did it. We made it to the end of a packed show. I caught up on three weeks worth of action for you guys. Listen, we had a lot. It, it, was, it was very busy. It was Father's Day. It was a lot going on. Didn't get a show to you for a couple of weeks, but I think we came back pretty strong. I think we brought it. We brought the info. We brought the entertainment. We brought the energy. And what I need you to do now is make sure that you share this with your friends. If, you, if you're watching it on YouTube, make sure you take this video Drop it in your Facebook page. Drop it in your Twitter link. Share it with everybody. Anybody and everybody. Let's bring more people into the conversation. Follow me on Twitter at TW Talk About. Also, follow my podcast page at Talking About Pod. All right. Follow us. Uh, follow the Impact Lounge. You're probably already following the Impact Lounge. But if you're not, make sure you're following the Impact Lounge. Follow BQ. All right. Let's keep this conversation going. Tweet me. I tweet back, okay? I'm usually watching Impact. If I'm not watching it live, I'll catch up on it a day or two after. And I love to get your takes on the show. I want to know the stuff you guys are hot about. Ask me questions. We'll interact on, on Twitter. Let's keep this conversation going. I love you guys so much. Thank you for listening. And I'll see you next week. Peace.